All right, so good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, this webinar is being hosted by the Office of Sustainability at Lakehead University. My name is Lita McKellar, and I'm the Sustainability Coordinator for Lakehead. This is part three of our webinar series, Sustainability in the Time of COVID-19. Uh, with the global pandemic, many of us have been spending a lot of time at home, and we wanted to offer a series of webinars that support sustainability and connecting to nature, even if from or near to our homes. So today's webinar will focus on harvesting wild foods, uh, preserving, storing, and how to use your foraged foods. And Karen Stevenson will present this webinar. Karen is an expert wild food educator, chartered herbalist, author, professional writer researcher, acute canine herbalism specialist, and a certified master naturalist through Lakehead University. She is also working on a master thesis on the immune enhancing effects of Griffola frondosa, otherwise known as Mitaki mushrooms, at Dominion Herbal College in BC, which is the oldest herbal school in Canada. Uh, I'm very excited that Karen agreed to present this second webinar. Uh, she also did one a couple weeks ago, as she has a vast amount of knowledge and experience foraging, and she's great at busting myths about foraging and also providing tips on how to make it accessible. So, uh, but before we start and Karen takes over, I just have a couple of quick housekeeping logistics to go over. So uh, this webinar is being recorded um, and that's so that we can upload it onto our websites for other people to see. Uh, due to the enormous interest in this webinar, we have disabled video and audio functions, but we know that many of you are interested in foraging and will have questions. So we will stop during the presentation for questions and then we also have reserve the final portion of the presentation for Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box, which you can find on your Zoom panel. It's usually at the bottom or sometimes the top of your screen. If you see a, a question in the Q&A box somebody else has asked, but you also want to ask it, you can vote on it and it will go higher in the priority list, making it more likely to be answered. Uh, please only use the chat box for technical issues and keep the questions to the Q&A box. And lastly, we know that foraging, it really covers a broad area. So please try to keep your questions specific to what's being discussed tonight. And since there are um, you know, a lot of people joining us, if you, to save time and avoid duplicating information, please be sure to listen and avoid asking a question that was already covered. Um, please also note that Lakehead University is not assuming responsibility for you. If you go foraging, any foraging done is at your own responsibility. And please make sure to educate yourself before you go out. And if in doubt, always check with an expert. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very much looking forward to the presentation myself. And with that, I will pass it over to Karen. Thank you, Lita. And in addition to thank you, Lita, thank you to Lakehead University Office of Sustainability. Um, this is a wonderful program that you have going and I'm really thrilled to be a part of it. So without further ado, let's move forward. Wait a second. We have technical issues. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> okay. Harvesting wild food, preserving, storing, and how to use your foraged foods. It's really, really exciting when we get out there and we learn what plants are edible or mushrooms or berries. And the first question after you figure out, can you eat it is, well, what do I do with it? Um, and this is what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight. And I certainly can't share with you absolutely everything you can do with them, but hopefully this will spark your imagination and uh, trigger you to get really, really creative in the kitchen. So what you're looking at right here is a plant, Glaucoma heteracea, which is your Creeping Charlie or ground ivy. Some people will be cursing this plant because it is the bane of every gardener. However, the versatility of this plant is absolutely amazing. And um, if you wanna learn a little bit more about that plant, you can go to my YouTube channel as I just recently did a video about that plant. Okay, so before we move a little further, I just want everybody to take a really good look at this picture. And if you were an individual wanting to go out and harvest burdock root, 
would you go for this particular plant? Now, I can't hear your answers, and I truly hope that your answers are no way, because this kind of a touches back on the webinar I did two weeks ago in terms of knowing your environment and keeping yourself safe. So for those who don't recognize this plant that's growing all around the burdock, this is poison ivy. Okay, wild edibles. Now, the one question people ask is, when do I harvest them? And unfortunately, each plant has a different answer. However, the one answer that can be applied to just about most wild edibles is that when the oils um, that create the flavor and aroma are at their peak, that's when they're best to be harvested. And the proper timing uh, really depends on what part of the plant that you want to harvest. For example, the foliage. Now, these are not steadfast rules, these are guidelines because, again, every plant is different. And so this is sort of, um, yeah, this will just give you, a, it's a guideline. So when we want to collect, let's say the leaves of pigweed or lamb's quarters, the best time to get those leaves are before the plant actually flowers. And if you want a plant for its flower, um, it's really, it's kind of tricky because let's talk about the daylilies, for example. Just before it reaches its maximum size, that's pretty much your last call to be harvesting that particular flower. Now, the most, um, uh, the time in which the oils are at their maximum and the flavor is at its best is generally just before the flower buds appear and right before they open. So very tricky because unless we're watching a plant, we don't know when this is gonna be. So, but daylilies before they open are fine. Um, when they open, they're fine to, to harvest as well. Roots, generally speaking, roots are often best preferred when they're harvested in the autumn. Dandelion roots pretty much can be harvested any time throughout the year. Uh, burdock specifically is an autumn harvested plant or root, um, more so for medicinal purposes. And, but again, these are just general guidelines. They're not rules that are etched in stone. Mushrooms. Each mushroom is different as to when you can harvest it and getting to know when comes with experience and trust me, that experience doesn't happen in a year or two. It's a lifelong process. And just when you think you're feeling really confident that you, you, know, you can go out there and harvest some mushrooms, there's always some lookalikes that will throw in a, a little monkey wrench. And so it's, it can get really tricky when it comes to harvesting mushrooms. When you are out there and you are gathering mushrooms, they are best gathered in a basket or in a paper bag. If you're out there and all you have is a plastic bag and you're not going to be back at your house for quite some time, you're going to have some moisture that's, that starts to build and that's not a good thing, not when you're dealing with wild mushrooms. And um, so it's, you know, yeah, again, make sure you have some paper bags with you. Um, if not a basket. The best time to clean those mushrooms are when you're out there. Have a little um, uh, brush with you, but, but something that's really soft, a toothbrush will work, and try to get the majority of the dirt and debris off while you're out there. Ideally, if there's any insects on it, they're best left right where they were. And um, yeah, it's, yeah, mushrooms are, they're amazing. I, I could go on forever, but I won't. I'm going to cut myself off right here. Fresh is best. So here's an example of some clean garlic mustard leaves and of course dandelions on the right. I store these in these, um, th these were store bought, or once upon a time it was store bought lettuce. And I, have, I don't know how many times I've actually tricked myself thinking I, I'm going to get some store-bought lettuce to make a salad and I grab the box going, oh yeah, I don't have any. All I have are these, which is fine. 
I'm sorry for the quality of this photo. It is not good. This is how I want to show you. Well, if it were clear, it would have been better. When you have, let's say, goldenrod, for example, or pigweed, this is one of the ways that you would like to dry them because um, I'm going to be discussing drying as one method of harvest or how to store your plants. And uh, yeah, it's when you hang, hang them like this, they need to be in an area in which there is no sunlight. Sunlight is going to zap the nutrients out of your foraged greens. Ideally, using a rubber band around the stems and open up a paper clip and hang it. And how long does it take to dry? I can't answer that question because it has everything to do with the moisture level in your home. Usually, I would say up to a week, but again, it depends on moisture level in the home and what specifically you have that's drying because some leaves are thicker and obviously they're gonna take longer. This is an item that I highly recommend. Again, I apologize for the quality of the image. This is called an herb dryer. This is, I think it's about six, seven feet in length and you hang it. It is absolutely incredible and I would recommend it to anybody who seriously wants to dry their uh, foraged goods or herbs from the garden. And the price is actually only $35 at Amazon. I don't really like promoting Amazon a lot, but unfortunately I have not found these anywhere else except Amazon. So it really, it makes it compact and yeah, it, it's easier to dry your herbs like this. Once your herbs are dried, what do you do with them? Well, here's some of my, actually I think these are mostly all my mushrooms. Um, so <laughs> what you do is make sure that you have labeled and put the date on your jars because most dried greens, dried mushrooms have a shelf life of two years. So if you're looking at the top there, you're gonna see that my birch polypore has to be used ASAP because we are at the two year mark. So what I do is I store them like this and then I usually end up putting most of that through a grinder and put it down into a powder form. Once they are powdered, you could use these in anything your soups and your stews and your mashed potatoes and the possibilities are absolutely endless add it to your smoothies add it to your uh, anything <laughs> so um and that way you're gonna have all the incredible benefits that these fungi or greens if you have if you're storing greens it's just I can never stress enough how great it is to be able to go have a variety to choose from. And you can even make teas, decoctions. The possibilities are absolutely endless. This is a big one. Okay. It is imperative that all plants and your fungi be totally dried before you put them into a mason jar. Uh, for storage because if there is any moisture at all, and I mean any, then you're going to have a really good chance that there's going to be some mold or bacteria that's going to form and rendering your entire jar useless. So it is really, again, really, really important that everything be dried properly and thoroughly. Some people will store their dried goods in plastic containers. That's a choice. I prefer mason jars. And there are a lot of people out there that like to just store what they have in paper bags. As long as your paper bag is rolled down properly and is sealed as well as it can be with using maybe clothes, clothesline clips, that would work. But again, make sure you label what you have and when you gathered it. Okay, so let's stop right here before I go any further. And Lita, how about we look at some questions about 
what we've discussed so far. Okay. Um, one, oh, I see someone's response just responded to it, but one person was wondering what, if you could re, uh, reiterate what the tall herb dryer was called. Okay. Uh, if you just go to Amazon, it is called exactly that herb dryer. Oh, okay. And someone also said you can get that at Lee Valley Tools. Ah, thank you. Nice to know that. Um, someone asked, <laughs> if you put dried mushrooms in mashed potatoes, will they cook enough? Yes, it's fine because once they're dried, they're safe. When you go to a health food store and you buy a bottle of reishi, um, for health purposes or for just as a, um, just for, for the sake of taking something to better your, your overall health. They're not cooked first. They're just simply dried. Okay. Um, someone has asked, can you use a dehydrator to take the moisture out, I guess, of, the, of your foraged foods? I do that with my mushrooms sometimes. Yes. And, but with my greens, for some reason, I can't answer it. It's just that little voice that talks to me in my head and no, I'm not schizophrenic. Um, <laughs> it says air drying is best. Uh, when I uh, was learning herbalism first through, uh, with Susan Elliotson, and, um, and she was a fervent believer in drying food or drying foods naturally. And, and I don't know whether that was just something that stuck with me or other research that my eyes have come across, but it, it's a personal choice. It truly is a personal choice. Okay. Uh, here's one I'm curious about too. Uh, what are your thoughts on silica gel packs to remove possible moisture in jars? No, no, that's, that's fine. If, you are going to go in and out of that jar frequently and and if the air is humid then yes moisture can get in um, especially if you leave the uh, lid of the jar off for any period of time but right at the get-go right at the beginning those herbs mushrooms must be thoroughly dried before storing okay um one question that was asked right at the beginning is what do you recommend for cleaning foraged wild plants? And I know I saw that you said a mush, uh, sorry, a toothbrush or a mushroom cleaning tool. Are there other tools that folks should know about? For mushrooms, most chefs that I know say never wash your wild mushrooms because it ruins the texture. And it does a couple of other things too, which elude my mind right now. Uh, so I have never washed any mushrooms that I have brought home. I do use a special toothbrush that I bought specifically for that. So uh, one that in which the bristles are really, really soft. And yeah, it's just as long as you've got all the dirt off and the insects, that's what counts. Um, it's not going to kill you if there is an insect on it and somehow it ends up getting cooked. Um, extra protein, <laughs> but that might freak a lot of people out. But I, I've, I've eaten bugs before, so, uh, but I know that's not for everybody, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, a couple people have asked, how do you know when they're dry enough? <laughs> if you are drying wild greens, they will crumble, and I mean crumble well. So that is your telltale sign for greens, and when it comes to mushrooms, they too will also crumble really good. Uh, so basically just take a little bit of what you have and uh, put it in your palm of your hand and, and rub it around. And if they're crumbling really, really good, you know they're dry. And how about um, dirt or dust on herbs versus mushrooms? Do you try to get that off? Yeah. I, I mean, I've eaten a little bit of dirt with my salad before. That's okay. It's a little gritty. It kind of you know, ruins the texture, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but ideally, uh, yeah, it, it, try to get as much dirt off as possible. I have rarely ever washed any wild greens that I've gathered. Many people would cringe at that thought. It's again, it's a personal choice. Um, washing 
is uh, something I definitely do though if I uh, for example if I'm in a very dusty area where um, I don't know just some days there just seems to be a lot of dust and dirt in the air and but you can tell by looking at the green and yeah those ones I definitely wash and I have an image that we're going to get to and I'll wait until then before I elaborate all right there's there are more questions but if you want to keep going um, I'll leave it up to you uh, we could we could get to them at the next break too um, okie dokie Okay, I, I just see a quick question here about reconstituting dried mushrooms. I have not, uh, yeah, I've not done that myself. Uh, not full mushrooms, like uh, full size. When, once they've been crumbled, sometimes I do reconstitute, just soak them in a little bit of water. And the length of time depends on how small or how big those pieces are. And then I use them. So I hope that answers your question. Okie dokie, so we'll move on to freezing. So as you see here, these I pulled out of my freezer, fiddleheads and dandelions. That's a very small portion of what I have. So let's talk about freezing our foraged goods. All right, here we go. What's this doing? Hold on. It is, there we go. Okay, so the big question to blanch or not to blanch. This is a big one because a lot of people will say you have to. There are some people that say they don't. Um, now, blanching is important. And, but when you under blanch, if you actually do go down that road where you want to blanch your foraged greens, if you under blanch them, it stimulates the activity of enzymes which ends up being worse than not even blanching at all. And if you over blanch, then you're going to lose flavor, color, and you're definitely gonna lose some vitamins and minerals. So what does blanching do? Blanching stops the enzyme actions which can cause the loss of flavor, color, and texture. And of course it can help to keep the color brightened and it halts the loss of vitamins and minerals actually. So the time is crucial and it really varies uh, depending on the vegetable, depending on the green. Uh, and from what I have been able to gather that items such as, let's say uh, dandelions, lamb's quarters, pigweed, um, most of those blanch them for one minute. So we're gonna get to how to blanch in a little bit. Um, so now before I get into the, the length of time for blanching, um, and I have a really great resource for you, I want to talk about what seems to be quite popular among some chefs and also just some individuals who say that, um, pre-freezing and pre-freezing is when you take your item and you lay it on parchment paper that's uh, on a baking sheet. You put it into the freezer for about two hours, and then you bring it out, put serving sizes into freezer bags, remove the air, and there you go. I have tried this. It works really well. The flavor is still amazing. Of course, now you have greens that are gonna crumble, but that's okay if you're using these greens for soups or stews. And um, so this is an option as well. And from what I've been able to ascertain is that when done this way, your freezed goods can last up to nine months. I've had mine in my freezer for 11 months and they've been fine. This is the amazing resource I recommend to anyone who wants to know how to can, how to freeze, how to ferment or pickle, make jams and jellies. The National Center for Home Food Preservation is absolutely incredible. Their tips are basic, they're, they're backed by science. They are absolutely amazing. And so when you, if you were to click on how do I, and then click on the freeze, 
they get into the hows of blanching, that how to, you know, how to blanch your peppers versus how to blanch your greens. Uh, so yeah, definitely go to the National Center for Home Food Preservation. These guys are totally amazing. And again, they're, yeah, you could, you could be, if you're into home canning, you'll be there for a long time. Okay, so before we pause, those of you who are with us tonight, who were with us two weeks ago, I had a special off my website and um, tonight I'm doing the same thing. So if you are interested in a copy of Fields of Nutrition, which has a lot of detailed information about 30 plants, including some history and medicinal and nutritional information, um, if you buy it this evening, or actually if you buy it up until June 30th, um, I will give you three complimentary $5 PDF pub, uh, plant publications. These are extremely thorough. The information in those are totally thorough. So we'll pause here. Any questions up to here so far? Um, there's a few. <laughs> Someone's asked what labels you're using on your jars because theirs are always falling off. <laughs> Well, that's a good question because that's the last thing you want is to get into a, into your cupboard and all of a sudden realize that your labels are on the uh, cupboard uh, and not on the jar. So um, sometimes I use the ones that come with the mason jars, but not all the time. Um, what I really find seems to stick very well is the electrical tape. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, um, but the electrical tape seems to uh, have a really good lifespan and uh and there's actually a couple of brands of masking tape where once it's on holy cow trying to get that stuff off is amazing or sometimes just take a piece of paper write down on the piece of paper what it is that is in your jar and just use regular scotch tape to keep it ad uh, adhered to the jar some other participants also said painter's tape and possibly elastics with a marker so there yeah. you go um, I think that this question you may have already answered. It's what is your favorite way to preserve mushrooms for later e eating, but they have said specifically lion's mane. Yeah, lion's mane. You know, it, it's funny. You would think, or I would think, I'd be the first person out there wanting to gather lion's mane or chanterelles or oysters and try chefing it up and creating incredible dishes and, and on the odd occasion I do but I find that there are quite a few wild mushrooms that I don't know they just don't do it for me in terms of flavor and it doesn't matter how I prepare them and and sometimes the texture just I don't know it, the texture doesn't do it for me either so this is why I go back to drying them because beta glucans in wild mushrooms is very high, the content, the, the content of beta-glucans is very high. And these are constituents that are absolutely, it, it's critical, mission critical, that we have these in our diet um, as part of the puzzle to keep our bodies running at optimum capacity. So yeah, I, I prefer to dry them and, and stick them in anywhere I can <laughs> throughout my breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Awesome. Someone is asking, what is your opinion on jelly flipping to seal the jar? I'm not sure what that is, but do you believe it to be safe? I don't have an opinion on that because when it comes to making jams and jellies, I have about a 40, 45% success rate. Uh, I know that sounds abysmal. I don't know what it is. Put me in a kitchen to try to make jams and jellies. Sometimes I do it well, and sometimes I end up with a jar of syrup. So... I that would be a question. I don't know, maybe that answer that could be answered at the um uh at that website. They might have a, a portal for questions. Okay. Um someone has asked, I found some herbs are better whoops, it just moved up in the thing. Uh have are better frozen than dried. Have you found any wild for, foraged uh greens or herbs that are better one way than the other? Absolutely. If like I use I use a lot of wild greens 12 months out of the year and I'm not about to 
um, use my dried lamb's quarters, for example, and try to incorporate that into a sauteed meal. It just doesn't work. So yeah, depending on, on what your tastes are in what you like or don't like to eat will depend on how much you want to freeze versus drying. Uh, I do a lot of freezing. So uh, yeah, for, but I have a lot of dried goods as well for another purpose, which we're going to see soon. Awesome. Um, what are your thoughts on eating ash bowl wheats? Have you tried them powdered? Yes, I have. Uh, they're not bad. They're not bad. But again, it's, um, there are a lot of bolets that I've tried. And if, they, if you cut them and they end up red or blue, don't touch them. Uh, that's the general rule of thumb. But also get to know exactly what specific bolete is it you have. Really, really important. Um, so yeah, again, it's just certain tastes just don't do it for me. And it just goes back to, you know, I like to dry them and use them in different meals. Okay. Um, someone has asked if resining would be, I think resining would be a good way to get rid of dust on your herbs, of leaves of herbs. Uh, uh, don't know. I have not any experience with that. So unfortunately I can't answer it. I just find, uh, sometimes I find, uh, if there's it really, again, it goes back to the humidity level of the air. If there's a fair bit of humidity and there's dust, that dust is gonna be sticking to the greens, therefore making washing a little bit more important versus um, if it's a crystal clear day and some dust um, is on the leaves, well, chances are most of that's just gonna blow off anyways as you, as you gather it. So um, yeah, hope, I hope that answers that question. Okay. What is the best way to preserve chicken of the woods? Ooh, that one I do cook up. <laughs> uh, my chickens I love. Uh, they do have a really nice flavor. So, uh, but it, I also do, again, I put those in my dehydrator and, uh, and save them. Okay, we will try one more at least. Um, so, well, someone is asking, they're new to this and they want to know when the best time to harvest elderberries is and what's your favorite method to dry them? Okay, elderberries, if you are in Ontario, you're not going to be able to gather them until late August or into September. Uh, they are late summer berry and I don't dry them, I freeze those. So yeah, if I put those in my dehydrator, they'd fall right through. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I freeze them. So I hope that helps. And, um, and then I see there's a question here from Susan about berries, like Saskatoon's are exploding this year. Susan, I agree. I don't know what's going on. Dandelions are on steroids. Milkweed flowers are already blooming. Um, Joe Pieweed is sitting at, at four foot tall right now. I I'm at a loss. I have suspicions, um, but I'm at a loss because every time I go out, I shake my head because yet another plant is at a growth stage that is normally mid to late July. It's, it is, yeah, it's interesting. It makes me wonder what's going to be left in August. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So we'll move right along from here. Or try. Here we go. Okie dokie. So I mentioned a little earlier that um, when we go out and we get forged goods, using them in the kitchen, it becomes a passion. It becomes an addiction. Um, there are so many different ways to use foraged plants, foraged berries, mushrooms, you name it. And the, the different varieties that you can create of vinegars or the different oils, um, different ferments that you can do, bitters, holy cow, like it's just like there's always something to try. And this is what's so exciting because all of our taste buds are different. So just because you see a recipe that calls for certain ingredients 
but you prefer a certain green other than the green that's being offered in that recipe, always remember recipes are guidelines. Okay. They're, they're never rules. They're not, they're not steadfast. They're, they're guidelines. So let's address a few of these before we do. Let's talk about the bitter truth. Okay. First thing I'd like to say is there was a philosopher who lived uh, in the 1700s. His name was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And he wrote a book called Emile. In that book, he was quoted as saying, the further we move from a natural mode of living, the more we lose our natural tastes. And in comes the dandelion. There's a lot of truth to be told about that one. Um, so many people, I don't want to eat the dandelion. It tastes bitter. Holy cow. Well, of course it does. It is bitter. Um, but there's a reason for that. We are supposed to have bitters in our diet. Without bitters, we become sick over a period of time because our, our whole food system now has been fattened, it has been sweetened, and it has been salted. So bitter foods are called bitter simply because of what they do, how they taste. They increase our saliva and our stomach acids. These are really critical functions to have happen in our digestive process. The foods help stimulate, I just see I'm getting so excited here, I'm waving my arms hitting the table. Um, <laughs> the foods have been, they've been shown that they stimulate, these bitters stimulate our digestive system and they improve the absorption of nutrition. And so many people have health issues right now and it goes right to the digestive system and the lack of assimilation of nutrition into our bodies. So now traditionally, bitters used to be quite common. They were used, um, the, whether it be root, the roots or the greens, they were often brewed into tonics and they were often served after a large meal to help stimulate other digestive enzymes and to provide comfort and relief. If you ate too much of something and in comes peppermint, most people will be aware that peppermint is one of these teas that helps after we've overdone it. Okay, I mentioned this one earlier about dandelions. Now, of course, dandelions are a bitter and they are a really important bitter. So what I do to help bring the bitter down just a little bit is I soak them in really cold water with a little bit of salt. I use sea salt and I let them sit for, and I put them in the fridge, probably two to three hours. After that, I put it in my salad spinner and then I store them in the fridge until ready to use. This helps to eliminate some of the bitters, which of course you're eliminate, eliminating some of what is actually good for us, but that's okay because I can actually eat one of those leaves and it tastes great. The leaves that you see here in this image are actually those that I gathered after the flower uh, appeared on the plant. And a lot of plants get a lot more bitter after the flower appears. So if you want to play around with some bitters, if I'll leave this on for a little bit of time. So if anybody wants to quickly type this up or make notes, these are wild plants that well, maybe not peppermint, but, uh, but these are plants that are very common bitter plants. And these are all plants that have a huge uh, purpose in helping to keep our digestive system working at optimal condition. With any one of these, you can add grapefruit peel, lime, lavender, lemon balm, mint, any mint. Uh, orange peel and and if the taste of it isn't still what you like add a little bit of honey or maple syrup so what you're gonna do is you can either make a tea or cold beverage with these and uh, yeah have a, a glass of this before or after a meal you're gonna find that you're probably gonna feel a little bit more energetic after that meal 
So I'll just wait a couple more seconds on the, <laughs> in case somebody's still writing down the, these names. But bitter foods have had a, they've been long revered for their powerful medicinal properties in herbalism, but not just herbalism, science is proving this as well. And it's really something I can never stress enough. And there's actually emerging research that shows bitter foods can stimulate bile. And bile is a fluid that's produced by our liver that works to break down and digest fats. This is good. Um, it aids in the prevention of malnutrition. I think I mentioned that one. And yeah, so bitters have far reaching effects on just about every aspect of our health. And I think I mentioned it also helps to bump up your energy levels to keep you feeling your best all day long. Kind of hard having bitters first thing in the morning, but if you drink black coffee, you've got bitters. This is my section of, or one section of my messy cupboard. So other uses for your wild plants. These are my tinctures. I think there's a few oils kind of mixed in there as well. I tincture, you name it, I tincture it, everything. Uh, sounds insane, but, but uh, I do so because I know a lot of people. So when somebody says to me, Karen, I got a, an issue with something, and I know you probably got some, let's say, there you go, the artist conch tincture. Um, then I, I'm able to say, here, put, I put some in a jar, here you go. And, uh, and it really, it, it's nice to be able to help people that way. Uh, doesn't cost much. You can use vodka. Um, vodka, a really good quality vodka is one of the most commonly used um, mediums that for, for tincturing. You can also use another type of alcohol that is 90, 94%. I would not recommend even breathing that one in because it burns the eyeballs out. And I've tried it actually and it's, I know, it just doesn't make tinctures fun anymore. <laughs> so uh, now you'll see on the right hand side, top shelf, there's a vodka uh, that I called immune. And there's a, a recipe I did uh, for that. It's on my website and any, any recipes that you're going to, I'm going to be talking about here tonight. I will be providing a link to these when this is posted up at YouTube. The immune tonic I made, I find is absolutely incredible absolutely amazing and I went through and I'm grabbing onto wood here with all my might I went through the entire winter with not even a sniffle so hey coincidence maybe diet of for of course that has a lot to do with it so yeah get into doing some tinctures and uh, and making some oils tinctures are great uh, if you need to improve your circulation you make a tincture of of uh, let's say scotch bonnets uh, or red cayenne peppers and you just put a couple of drops that's all you need a couple of drops into a big glass of water and you're going to help your circulation i can go on forever about tinctures and oils but let's keep going vinegars here is another incredible way to preserve and have your wild plants stored for a good two to three years now you're gonna see I've used some garden herbs and, and trust me, these four jars are only four of about 16 that I have because I like making a whole different, uh, you name it, I, I've done it. As, as you can see, I've got can on the right, alfalfa, red clover, mint, dandelion, yellow dock. Um, I think probably the absolute best tasting vinegar is wild leek and garlic oh my gosh that is amazing now when you make these vinegars you of course you can use them as salad dressing but these two can be used as a tonic so you take some of let, let's say i don't know um uh three four tablespoons of one of these vinegars and you add it to one of your favorite juices or just to water and drink it that way. And interestingly enough, I think it was about two months ago for the first time in a grocery store, I saw Bragg's um, selling, they have small bottles of fruit juices in which they have used their vinegar in it. So again, 
you can make all sorts of different vinegars mix and match with whether it be apple juice or mango juice or or whatever um this is a great way again for bitters to be used or any wild green or or wild flowers so the one of the questions or probably some of the questions that are popping up right now is well how do i make an herbal oil or a vinegar or a tincture how do i make teas how do i make salves salves i'm going to get into shortly and if you go to my website go to the bottom right hand corner of my website and you're going to see freebies and this is what will pop up so there are pdf files and uh, hopefully these will help you and, and if you have kids well i got some coloring books and crossword puzzles and all sorts of stuff there salve now salve is basically a homemade cream what you're looking at here are calendula flowers and chickweed and some broadleaf plantain. I make salves and depending on what specific purpose you wanna have a salve, depends on what you will make. There's a whole world to explore out there. And again, your wild greens can be used for making salves and this would be the end result of making salves. You can make lip balms and it's, again endless possibilities of being able to use wild foraged goods although you're not going to eat this now we're going to stop here for some more questions before i get into some recipes all right karen i, I think i can speak for everyone when i say we're very envious of your pantry <laughs> it looks great um, I only showed you the good part there. I hadn't showed you the, the messy part yet. <laughs> I've got a lot of sorting to do. <laughs> One uh, person, uh, this came up in the chat box actually, is asking if you can use gin because they're allergic to alcohol with wheat or corn. Mm. I would suspect you could use gin. I know rum is uh, an alternative that some people use. And of course, if you are or were an alcoholic, you don't want to be using any alcohol at all when making tinctures. And that's when you would use up organic apple cider vinegar. So I would suspect gin, but I don't have any experience with that. So perhaps ask Dr. Google. Okay. And um, someone is asking, uh, burdock leaf is so bitter, but the root is kind of starchy. Does it still have that bitter effect on digestion? Yes. Yes. So it highly beneficial for our digestive system. Absolutely. Okay. And here's a question I'm, I was also wondering is what about dandelions from the lawn? Can, are they okay? What about are there any toxins from the lawnmower or somewhere, something else? Well, I have a push mower. Um, I don't think a regular like electric or gas mower would have much of an effect um maybe i don't like if you got into the nitty-gritty science of it it might uh but i don't know i know i mean let's if you mowed the lawn your dandelions are pretty much gone um so but as long as you've not fertilized or have used any pesticides or insecticides then your dandelions should be good so okay yeah um, well, someone's asked if you've made dandelion root coffee. I'm not really sure what their question is beyond that, but perhaps has it been successful? Uh, I see that. Okay, James. Hi, James. Uh, yes and no. Um, I, I have made a beverage with uh, dried, dandy or, uh, dried dandelion root. It's not coffee. Um, it just doesn't taste like coffee. <laughs> so, um, but... I don't think it tastes totally amazing by any means, but what I like to do is you can um, roast your dandelion root or chicory roots, uh, your mushrooms, even your dried mushrooms, what I, uh, what I was speaking about earlier. Grind them down, add them to your coffee. Put that through your coffee maker and holy cow, is your, your coffee is gonna be like super sized in, in terms of nutrition. Sounds great. Um, how about, um, do, do you have some examples of what, uh, what you use dandelion leaves for? 
I'm sure you have several, but I have an, coming up. <laughs> yeah, I have an image coming up and I'll talk about that. Um, so yeah, dandelion leaves are not just for salads or soups. Um, I will show you shortly what, uh, some other uh, ways of using them are. And, uh, yeah, so, um, I'm seeing a question here from Tara. Uh, should I dry plantain leaves before infusing oil? No, you do not have to. As long as what you have gathered is free of moisture. So you'll see that if you uh, download the freebie off my website, when you can use fresh plant matter when it comes to making infused oils, but the green that you're using, whether it be plantain or the flowers, let's say calendulate, they have to be free of moisture, meaning no morning dew, no raindrops. Um, so optimally 11 a.m., 11.30 a.m. is usually a time that I was taught to gather for making infused oils and uh, but again i have to stress no morning dew no no anything because any moisture whatsoever it is going to cause mold in your infused oil okay um uh, tara again i think has also asked do tinctures get old and how much and how often do you take it? Well, I, that's probably different for you to take tincture, but how do they get old? Tinctures or alcohol. So, well, unless you're using the vinegar, vinegar has a shelf life, alcohol tends to last pretty much forever. So I wouldn't say that your tincture should last forever, but you've got pretty much a good three to five year window on it. And how much do I take a day? Uh, my immune therapy uh, tincture, I take a swig. If that, if that sounds uh, logical, a swig maybe would be a tablespoon. And uh, uh, yeah, I send it down with water though, because I, I find it very strong, but mm -hmm. yeah. And a couple of folks asked what kind of base vinegar you use. Organic apple cider vinegar. Um, I did mention that Bragg's sells uh, their uh, fruit juices with their vinegar in it. Whenever I find Bragg's here in my area, it, they're all in plastic bottles, so I stay away from them like the plague now. I do not want to buy organic apple cider vinegar that's been sitting in a plastic bottle. So when I do plant walks, I like to promote local, and local is uh, a company up near Owen Sound, or down if you're in Thunder Bay, uh, called Phil Singers. And I always highly recommend Phil Singers because their organic apple cider vinegar is just as good as Bragg's and it's it's local for us here in Ontario. Okay. Um, I'm, a couple questions on making things, which I think you're about to get to. Mm -hmm. um, how about storing the vinegars and tinctures? Is there a specific temperature you store them at? Room temperature in a dark, cool well as, as cool as you can location um i'm in a ra i live in a raised bungalow and um and i have a special room where i keep all my tinctures and oils and they are in a cupboard so they never see the light of, light of day unless i'm bringing it out to use them okay um barry is wondering about rose hips in the fall for jelly they're high in vitamin c but will the vitamin c be destroyed when boiling for the jelly Mm, it'll take a hit. Yep. Yeah. It'll definitely take a hit, but how much? I don't know. Uh, I've not made um, rose hip jelly, and but I do suspect that in the cooking process that's probably being cooked for, I don't know, about a good five, ten minutes at least. So it will take a hit. Yes. Um, someone has also asked about in the York region, like, are there places to forage? I'm not sure if you can answer that, but that one came up a while ago. Okay, I, I see. That's Nazia. Hello, Nazia, fellow York Region resident. Okay, um, in York Region, unless you are on private property, you cannot forage. Um, the I think public parks were okay to forage, and, but that could be, depends on the municipality you're in, whether it be Vaughan, Markham, Newmarket, etc. Um, and as for black walnut trees, I do know of some, but it is on York Region Forest property, which means it is verboten to take it, anything from one of those forests. Okay. 
And a couple of folks have asked, well, what are tinctures used for? I'm sure it's different for every tincture, but can you explain like what, what a tincture is, basic premise? Yeah, um, so what happens with a tincture is uh, you are putting the plant matter into vodka or, or your substrate, which could be vodka or rum or your organic apple cider vinegar. And during the infusion process, all the, the constituents, the healthy constituents are coming out of the plant and going into that vinegar or into that alcohol. So therefore rendering that alcohol or vinegar very, very healthy. And, but I mean, you don't go drinking it like a glass of vodka. Oh my gosh, no way. That's not what the, what the, uh, what a tincture is intended for. Um, it is, tinctures are used medicinally. And um, so taking a few drops here or there is usually what most herbalists will prescribe. Um, yeah, it's, even though it's in alcohol, you don't drink it like it's an alcoholic beverage. No way, because you're going to end up in some serious trouble. Okay. I just noticed the time. So it's almost eight. Oh, let's, um, okay. Let's boogie so, on. Let's. <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, cause some folks might have to go for those that do, um, there's just a question I want to make sure that, that you could answer for them is that sure. can you just remind them where, how to get your resources online. Yes. Okay. So, uh, what you want to do is go to a trustworthy website, uh, in order to uh, get your information, of course, I'm one of them, uh, ediblewildfood.com. Sorry, and, and the question was specifically for your resources. Oh, mine, like where I get mine? Oh, I think they just want to know, is it ediblewildfood.com? And, and Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and if, and if you, anybody who has to go right now, uh, thank you for being here. And if you have any questions, please uh, send me an email, info at ediblewildfood.com. Uh, please give me three days to respond because I could be overwhelmed with questions. Um, so for those of you who have to go again, thank you. I really appreciate you being here. And for those who are sticking around, let's check out some cool recipes. So Karen has kindly offered to stick around for another 15 minutes. So we will we'll get to the recipes now. Thank you. All righty. So don't these raspberries look good? <laughs> Anyways, there we go. Okay, this is something that I do that many people may want to do themselves now. What I do is, of course, once I have dried a lot of my wild greens, I store them, and when I'm ready, I put them into a grinder, break it right down into a powder, and I use a combination of different plants. Then I have my own do-it-yourself green smoothie mix. So I add it into whatever I make my smoothies out of, whether I put a banana in there or um, coconut water, whatever. What got me going on this is that there are so many companies out there that have capitalized on the, the mantra that their blend of super greens are going to get you all the nutrients that you need on a daily basis. Well, that's okay. And, and that is wonderful because chances are they do. But have you seen the cost of these green powder blends? They're pretty pricey. And look what you can do yourself. It's cheap. It's free. It doesn't get any better than being free. And when you get the right combination of plants, you're getting almost every mineral and vitamin that your body needs. If you want to know what plants I use to create these, you go to my blog and just type into the search uh, DIY green smoothie. Green smoothie or or put, yeah, uh, make smoothie mix or you'll find it. It's, it's on my blog. So, and it's again, free, didn't cost a dime. These, okay, anybody interested in these? Get out now, it's springtime, go gather your maple leaves. I, again, I'll put the recipe, the link to the recipe once this is on YouTube. These are deep fried maple leaves. My son, one of my sons, lived in Japan uh, for just over a year. And he brought my attention to a woman in Japan who for decades has a storefront in which she does deep fried maple leaves. And from her, I learned how to do it. And this is not a process that is just a matter of a day or two. You do have to salt the leaves and let them cure for about uh, seven, eight months. 
before you can actually get it to this uh, to the stage. But wow, what a treat! Another thing <laughs> or that you can do um, with your wild greens: add them to your salt. What better way um, to increase the nutritional level of your salt? We do have to have sodium in our diet. That is a given. So why not add something else to that salt that is going to be beneficial? And as you can see, this is my uh, stash of uh, wild leeks that I have dehydrated. And the jar on the left, probably, I, I couldn't even begin to tell you how many leaves it took to get that much. Cordiales. Now, typically a cordial is an alcoholic beverage. Um, but there is a non-alcoholic version that you can make. And again, I have written about this and it's on my blog. Look at the colors, eye candy, huh? Eye candy, I love it. Um, and wow, what a taste. They are absolutely delicious. Purslane. Purslane is a plant that tends to grow in hot climates or warmer climates. And the uses for purslane are astronomical. On the left is a smoothie, and that smoothie mix uh, can be made into popsicles, as you can see. Purslane has a very high concentration of omega-3 and a lot of other vitamins and minerals. So if it grows near you, it is definitely one of those plants that uh, I would highly recommend gathering. And it is actually a very pleasant tasting wild green. Jelly. This is actually, it was a jelly that actually turned out. Um, <laughs> for, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes I, my uh, success rate for jellies is not that great, but uh, this is made from wild violets. And again, the color, the fuchsia color is just absolutely mouthwatering and it's certainly eye candy. So jellies, um, to the individual who is asking about what to do with dandelion leaves, very easy. Throw your dandelion leaves after they're clean, put them into a bowl, add a little bit of oil, and you can either at that point add spices that you like, or if you have a favorite bottle of teriyaki sauce or jerk sauce or you know, honey garlic sauce or anything, just add a little bit, mix it all together, put parchment paper on a baking sheet, lay them out flat, and bake them. Bake them at a very low temperature. And just kind of watch it because depending on the size of your dandelion leaves uh, will determine how quickly they will crisp up. Now you've got dandelion leaves here so you can eat them like potato chips and they're way healthier but you can also and this is what I did tonight actually I roasted some cauliflower and some zucchini I roasted dandelion leaves and then I crumbled up the dandelions and added it to the roasted cauliflower and uh, zucchini and wow was it good you can use plantain leaves do the exact same thing fermenting fermenting is so easy this is sauerkraut this is wild leek sauerkraut once you get the hang of it it is so easy and so healthy now fermenting can be a process that can be intimidating to some individuals. But if you want to be inspired, I highly, highly recommend Pascal's book. Pascal is an incredible individual. He has this book, Wildcrafted Fermentation. And when you go through this, if you don't want to try any of his recipes, you'll certainly be inspired to get very creative and try new recipes of your own. Um, absolutely amazing and I would highly recommend that you have this book in your personal library and there we go so if uh, you liked what you saw <laughs> I'm always very appreciative of anybody who uh, supports me on social media um, please like my Facebook page subscribe at YouTube and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. I truly, truly appreciate it. Lita, I can't thank you and Lakehead University enough for allowing me to be here. And uh, let's wrap up with a few last questions. 
All right, that was great. Honestly, I can't wait to go forage and get all crafty with all this inspiration. Um, so a couple of folks have asked which plant, like what was the recipe for that immunity tincture you had mentioned? I'm sure you, it may be available online. Yeah, if you subscribe <laughs> to uh, my YouTube channel, links to all recipes that I mentioned here in this uh, webinar will be there. And that will include uh, my immunity uh, recipe. And uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely well worth it. It is so powerful. It's, it's really good. Okay. Uh, Crystal is wondering if evergreen tips in the, if all the ever, evergreen tips in the spring are ed edible, she's made some fabulous beverages, but she'd like to be certain about it. Ah, uh, well, spruce, hemlock, not the hemlock plant, the hemlock tree, uh, pine, absolutely, they are all usable. Um, again, it'll depend on your taste buds, what you like, what you don't like. Um, I find red pine a little bit more powerful than white pine, for example. Um, but yes, those tips are usable. Okay. Um, how can black walnuts be used? They are bitter to eat as plain nuts. I don't use them. I, I've never worked with them. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Um, I have found that by the time I can get out and gather walnuts or yeah, the, the wildlife get to them first. So I've not had any opportunity to, to explore with those. Okay. Um, do you harvest Solomon's seal root? Um, you, yes and no. Uh, you don't do it for food. You do it for medicinal purposes and you need to know what you're doing. So for all intents purposes, I'm going to say no. Um, so, but the berries, yes but don't get them mixed up with the false Solomon seal. Otherwise you'll be sorry and you're gonna be sitting on your toilet for a very long time. Good to know. Um, Jennifer is wondering what brand of vodka do you use if, if you use a specific one? If you have a local distillery, I would highly recommend support your local distillery. Um, there are a lot of brands out there that are good. I really truly don't think there's much of a difference between the big name ones that you have to pay $10 more a bottle for. Um, I, I don't know whether it's true or not, but sometimes I think you're paying for that label. Sort of like, you know, buying clothing, right? You pay for the label. Uh, but yeah, if, if there is a local distillery, please support your local distillery. Um, Julianne is wondering if you can dry nettle in the basement or is there too much moisture in the basement? Well, there's a 74% humidity level in my basement right now, so no. Um, <laughs> so unless you're running it, uh, running a de uh, dehumidifier, uh, which uh, I will be putting back on shortly. Uh, so I do have plants on my herb dryer right now, and they are in a room in which the humidity level is quite high. So uh, it's just going to take a lot longer for them to dry, that's all. Okay. Just some nice comments here. Susan Maliki says, Karen, if you're ever in Thunder Bay, you're welcome to join me for a walk on our property to forage. Susan, I love you. I'm in Thunder Bay a lot. You might be sorry. Um, <laughs> Susan, there's a group called Thunder Bay Foragers. Please, if you're not already a part of that Facebook group, please uh, ask to join it. And I will be announcing there whenever I will be in Thunder Bay. Great. So Hannah wants to know, um, how do you store mugwort? Aha, mugwort. Um, mugwort I store, again, I dry it and I put it into mason jars. Um, mugwort uh, is coming into its growing stage in which it is going to be optimal to use it for making bitters. So probably within the next uh, week and a half to two weeks. So, but yes, uh, if I don't use it fresh, I dry it and I store it in mason jars. Okay. Um, when is the wild late leak too late to pick? Well, when the leaves start wilting and I don't think there's anywhere right now that they are still forageable unless you are perhaps up near Moosonee. Um, even then that's not the terrain in which they would grow. Uh, yeah, I think it's 
you just have to be out there and you have to monitor it. And, but once those leaves start wilting and changing color, then you know it's past its best before date. And have you ever made flour from plants or bark? Yes, yes. Um, I've made flour from the seeds of the yellow dock or some people call it curly dock uh, plant because the one plant grows a prolific amount of seed and I do not worry about removing the sheath. I just grind everything right up. Tastes not bad at all. It's a pretty, it makes a pretty heavy flour. So you might want to add a little bit of uh, regular flour with it and, uh, and lamb's quarter uh, seeds as well I've used. And that actually turned out very tasty. But again, I have to use it with another flour. Otherwise I end up with uh, weights. <laughs> It's almost 8.15, so I think we'll wrap it up pretty soon. Um, okay. I will just answer Aline. Uh, sure. Any good Toronto-based foraging books, Facebook groups, etc. I do have a meetup group. I don't know the URL for it right now. So if you want to send me an email, info at ediblewildfood.com, I will let you know the uh, URL for my meetup group in Toronto. Um, and Mandy, thank you, thank you. I look forward to letting you choose your three free PDFs. Um, any foraging groups in New Jersey, perhaps try Meetup. Uh, Meetup does have quite a few good, uh, good uh, foraging groups across the United States and Canada, so try Meetup. Um, Mar Marilis, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, wild garlic mustard, what can you not do with it? Um, you can turn it into pasta, use a little bit into salads. Uh, a little bit into hummus, um, the possibilities are endless. And that's what you would do with the leaves. If you like horseradish, use the root. The, the root of the garlic mustard is almost bang on to horseradish. Tastes amazing. Angela, any foraging groups close to Niagara Falls? Um, again, check um, meet up and see what's in your area. Failing that, um, I do go into that area sometimes to do walks, so you could stay in touch with me via email. Um, purslane growing, this is for Michelle. You have purslane growing in between bricks on your patio. Yeah, they tend to like that. Oh, saltwater pool, hmm. I don't know if, does it get a lot of that salt water on it? And and I guess if there's no other chemical, it might be safe, but I can't say for sure. And Aline, uh, the sugars that I use for jellies, white sugar, typically white sugar is the best, but I don't like white sugar. I prefer organic cane sugar. Amber, dehydrating leaks in the oven. Uh, I've not done it in the oven. I use uh, my dehydrator actually for that. And witch hazel, I love witch hazel. Michelle Mahoney, um, witch hazel, I never ever wash my face with water or soap. And I know that sounds insane. What I use is I have witch hazel and those little cotton pads. I soak the cotton pad and I, I wash my face with witch hazel. It's a cleanser, it's an astringent. And that way I'm not getting the, the fluoride or the chlorine that's in my tap water on my face. Um, Joanne, rather than vodka, can you use rum? Yes, you can. Uh, Joanne, uh, horsetail. I have a recipe for horsetail tooth powder. So that's on my website. And if you want more information about that, please email me. Info at ediblewildfood.com. And how are we doing on time here? Uh, it's 8.16. Okie dokie. Um, okay, how about one more question? How about, um, okay, Moffitt, about wild rice. I, I'm sorry, I don't have any experience with uh, growing or harvesting wild rice. Uh, I cheat. I buy it in the store. And um, yeah, Shannon, how do you make a tincture? Go to my website, ediblewellfood.com. Go to the bottom right-hand corner. You'll see freebies. And when you open up that freebies, you'll see a PDF file that will address that question. So there we go. Um, yeah, if anybody didn't have a question answered, um, please email me at info at ediblewildfood.com. 
And, but please allow me up to three days to get back to your questions because I might be overwhelmed. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Karen. I, I saw a bunch of comments. Someone said you just made their 45 minute drive home worthwhile. So um, Yay. <laughs> lots, of, lots of positive feedback. Um, sorry to those whose questions weren't answered. Um, we tried to get to as many as we could. And that's all the time we have for today. So a round of virtual applause, I guess, for Karen. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to present to us. And I, you just have such a wealth of experience. It's uh, really appreciate, appreciate being able to learn from you. And again, I'm really envious of your pantry. Um, it was really informative and I'm sure we're just tip, touching the tip of the iceberg. Oh yeah. Um, so for someone like myself who's a beginner, it's just, it's just so good to have a bit of a foundation and I'm just excited to get out into the field now. Um, so yeah, on behalf of Lakehead University and our Office of Sustainability, thanks so much for joining us and uh, to everyone as well for uh, viewing our presentation. Good luck foraging and have a great evening. And thank you again, Lita. Thank you, Lakehead University. And thank you to each and every one of you out there. Your support is truly appreciated right from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And these recordings will be available online. All the links are in the chat boxes and uh, feel free to email Karen or I too if you can't access them. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good night, everybody.